Turn your Bibles to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. Started this morning a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And as I said this morning, it was kind of a, a difficult choice to preach this series because I've written a book on it, but that also gives you an opportunity. Uh, our theme verse for the church is Acts 17, 11. These were more noble in that they received the word with all raised mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things are so. As I talked about this morning, I could drink this entire glass of water and it's not going to quench your thirst. I hope it makes you thirsty. I hope my sermon makes you thirsty for God and to know more about him. And so I would encourage you during this series to do your own study and your own devotions from Galatians chapter 5. First of all, memorize verses 22 through 25. If you've got it memorized, see me tonight. I've got some Starbucks cards in my pocket. I, I'd be glad to give to you as a gift for memorizing it, and I'll keep giving it out until they're all gone. And then after that, it's going to be something a little less. Uh, I can't afford everybody. Uh, but I'll have something for you when you memorize those verses. Thy word have I hid in my heart. And then not only that, I'd encourage you to go through the scriptures from the message during your devotions or as part of your day throughout this week. And you can do it one of two ways. If you'd like a copy of my sermon notes, if you will email me at wayne.surface at ohana.church. Wayne.surface at ohana.church. I'll send you a copy of the notes, then you've got all the scriptures to look up. Or you can use the book. And in the book has got uh, the first chapter is the one I covered this morning. Uh, I added some things to it, and, and it's a little different than the book directly, but the book will remind you of what we preach. Um, and so if you don't have a copy, if you've come to the church, you're welcome to a copy. If you've never received one, it's my gift to you. And uh, if not, you can purchase a copy. Uh, we usually charge $10 a book, but uh, I'll give it to you for $8, and, and uh, that helps us cover the cost of the book. But uh, And it's something also you can maybe send to somebody. A couple of you mentioned me, boy, I, I, my, my cousin needs this, my friends back home need this. And, and maybe you might purchase the book to send to them, or you might uh, encourage them to watch the message on live stream as well. I, I think this is one of the most important series that you can go through. And just understanding, we're, right now on Wednesday night, we're teaching on pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit, and these are, these are together. You really need to hear Wednesday night, because we're going to talk about what it means to be filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, and, and especially what are the gifts of the Spirit. The Bible tells us, there's two places God says, don't be ignorant, don't be stupid. And one of them is about salvation, and the other one is about the area of knowing what your gift is and how to use your gift. And the honest truth is that in this room right now, the majority of you could not tell me, could not only not tell me what your gift is, but you couldn't even tell me what the gifts are. And you need to understand the gift of giving, the gift of serving, the gift of uh, mercy or whatever it is. And when you got saved, God gave you a gift or gifts and you need to understand what they are and how to use them. And that's what we're going to study on Wednesday night. So very much tied together with the fruit of the Spirit is also the gifts of the Spirit as well. And so I would encourage you to stay up with this series, come out on Wednesday night and stay up with that series. If you have to miss, they're all online at Facebook Live, but it's so much better to be here than to watch it online. I hope you'll plan to be a part of that. Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 through 25. Let's uh, read it together. We're going to read from the King James Bible. So if you don't have one, uh, just look at the person next to you. But let's go ahead and read uh, verse number 22 and 23 together with the list of the fruit of the Spirit. So let's begin. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And we'll talk about that last phrase, there is no law in a later message. And it goes on, verse 24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections of lust. If we live in the spirit, in other words, if you're saved, you have the spirit of God. If you live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And that's the key verse there that we want to remember as we go through this series. Let's go ahead and bow for prayer. Father, we ask tonight as we open up your word that you would open it to our hearts and to our lives. We pray that you'd help us understand the fruit of the Spirit from this passage, but also, Lord, from other places in the Bible, the other fruits that you want us to produce as well. And so we pray that you would continue to work in our lives and that you would produce the fruit every day. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now tonight, as I said this morning, with each of the fruits of the Spirit, now remember it's fruit because God's created a unique blend of his fruits in your life. Just like every bottle of fruit juice has a unique flavor, God's going to combine all of the fruits to 
to uh, create one unique flavor in your life, okay? And uh, but as we go through the individual fruit, love, joy, peace, and so on, we're going to use a fruit to illustrate each one of them. So you might in your mind, as you meditate on this ahead of time, is think about what fruit would I use for love? What fruit would I use for joy? Well, tonight, the fruit I'm going to use is the fruit of pineapple. And is there anybody who thinks they know what the fruit of the pineapple is going to represent? Which fruit of the Spirit, right? Long-suffering. No. That's a good one because it takes about 18 to 24 months to grow a pineapple. So you've got to have long-suffering to grow one. Uh, anybody else got an idea what the fruit of the Spirit is? Yes. Meekness. meekness. Nope. 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 Not meekness. All right, Brandon, this is your fourth try now, okay? What? Joy. Joy. Nope. You would say joy too? All right, we'll go over here. Peace, nope. All right, now let me tell you the truth. You could go love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness. You're not going to get it right because there are more fruits of the Spirit than just the ones listed in Galatians chapter 5. That's always important. Remember in your Bible, God doesn't always give you all of them in one place. You got to do comparing Scripture with Scripture. So let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 11 and look at verse number. 30. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 30. They're also going to put it up here on the screen. Proverbs 11 and verse 30. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that when his souls is wise. So I've chosen the pineapple to represent the fruit of souls, of winning souls to Christ. Now a pineapple, as Brother Mike realizes, it takes about 18, 24 months to grow a pineapple. It's not a fast growing plant. And sometimes we need to understand soul winning, it, it takes time to bring somebody to Christ. And a lot of us, we get discouraged and we quit and we give up on people long before they have a chance to develop and to grow and to be ready to harvest them for Jesus Christ. And so if you're going to win souls to Christ, you've got to be patient. You've got to take the long look and be willing to take the time to cultivate and to grow that relationship and to cultivate and grow the seed of the Word of God in people's lives. What you need to do is you need to sow the seed. It's amazing how you can have just a little seed, a tiny little seed that can grow into great big things. In in Luke chapter 8 and verse number 11, it says the seed is the Word of God. Now, we need to remember that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so whenever you're soul winning, whenever you're witnessing to somebody, it's important to plant the seed of the word of God. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, then not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God commendeth his love towards us, and why are yet sinners Christ died for us? In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, if that's, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God is raised in the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart men believeth unto the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, of course, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. First John chapter five, verses 12 and 13. Uh, he that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the son of God. John chapter one, verse number 12, but as many as received him, to them gave the power to become the sons of God. You, you could go on and on and on with that. Now, you don't have to use every one of those verses, but when you're witnessing to somebody, when you're planting the seed, you are not planting the seed if you're not planting the word of God. And so the seed is the word of God. First Peter chapter one and verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We talked about this on uh, Wednesday night in my class on pneumatology, you say the Holy Spirit. Uh, in order to have conception of life, you've got to have a seed and an egg come together and uh, create conception in the womb. And the same thing is true. Spiritually, you've got the Holy Spirit who brings conviction. You've got the Word of God. And when those two come together in receptive heart, then somebody is new, given new life. They're regenerated or born again. And so our job is to present the seed, the word of God. It's the 
Holy Spirit's job then to con- bring about conception and regeneration through conviction. And so we need to do our part in the process, which is sowing the seed. See, our problem is our so-so attitude. When it comes to soul winning, most Christians have a so-so attitude. It's kind of like, well, yeah, I know I'm supposed to soul, go out and tell people about Christ, but uh, I, I'm just not really good at that, and I don't know who to talk to or how to talk. And we just got this so-so attitude where the Bible says in Mark 16, 15, and he said to, unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. See, it's not a so-so attitude with God. God says it's our job. It's our calling. It's our purpose in life to go into all the world and preach the gospel. People all around us are dying, going to hell, and we don't care enough to give them a track. We don't care enough to invite them to come to church, we, we, let alone witnessing to them. You know, it, it, it ought to be that on, on Saturday morning, we're out sideways. We ought to have the whole church out there because we're reaching souls for Christ. You know, one of the top ways we get people to church is just from sign waving. There are people that are wanting to go to church. They just don't know where. And, and they need us to let them know, and not just with sign waving, but giving them tracts and, and personally inviting them to come out and telling them about the church and, and, and just being a soul winner. But we've got this so-so attitude. In Psalms chapter 126, verses 5 and 6, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. When's the last time you cried and shed a tear for somebody's lost and going to hell? When's the last time that you were so burdened in your heart you had to tell them about Christ? You couldn't hold it back. See, our problem is our so-so attitude. Now, folks, you can find excuses. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 4, it says, He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. There's always an excuse of why you can't go out for, um, for the uh, sign waving, why you can't go out and do the prayer walk, or why you can't go to your neighbor and buy him the church. There's just always an excuse. There's always reason. I- I'll do it later. And you'll always find an excuse not to witness, but God has given us a reason to witness, and that's to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the question is, what are you going to do? Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Are are you going to continue to have the so-so attitude and just kind of like, well, you know, I just don't have time and I don't know how to witness and I I don't know who I'm supposed to invite to church and, you know, it's just on and on and on. Or are you going to do something? So what are you going to do? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 14 and 15, it says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live on themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I am so thankful that a man named Bill Divert did not have a so-so attitude about witnessing to a 14-year-old boy. Because I'd be in hell today without Christ. See, folks, somebody cared enough to plant the seed in your life. It might have been a Sunday school teacher. It might have been your parents. It might have been a pastor. It, it, it might have been a neighbor or a friend or whoever it was, but somebody maybe gave you a gospel track or invited you to come to church, or maybe they invited your parents to come to church, and through that you got saved. Somebody took time to talk to you in a Sunday school class, whatever else it might be, because they didn't just have a so-so attitude. They said, so what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about this? The Bible says in verses 19 and 20, it says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to Christ. See, it's our calling, it's our our command, it's it's our responsibility, and we cannot we cannot continue with this so so attitude. You've got to get the attitude. I I've got a job, I've got a calling, I've got a responsibility. There are people that are dying and going to hell, and I'm the one that needs to tell them about Jesus Christ. I need to plant that seed because I'll guarantee you there will always be an excuse. So why? I'm not going to go over there and talk to them today. 
I, I, I'm not going to invite them to church today. I'm not going to go out. It, it's just always going to be an excuse. You see, what you've got to do is you've got to sew it together. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. The thing is, if you're going to be a soul winner, if you're going to sow seeds for Christ, you've got to learn how to sow the gospel together. In other words, you, you need to know how to present the gospel in simplicity and sincerity. Do you know the Bible verses? Do you, do you know where to start? You've got to start with, with somebody that you've got to understand, I'm a sinner. They've got to understand because of their sins, they're going to die and go to hell. They can't go to heaven because heaven's a perfect place and God can't allow sin into heaven. They've got to understand that, that God loves them and sent his son to die for them. They've got to understand that Jesus died and was buried and rose again to give them power over sin and, and, and to give them the victory over sin and death. And they've got to understand that they've got to trust Christ their Savior. So you've got to be able to simply and sincerely be able to tie all that together. And that means knowing the Bible verses and, and knowing how to explain it, having simple illustrations that will help. And one of my favorite illustrations, I use a wallet. And I tell people, the Bible says that this hand represents you and I. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This wallet represents our sin. And our sin, this hand represents God. Our sin separates us from God. And so somehow we've got to get rid of the sin. Well, what we do is we try to cover it up with our good works. Let this piece of paper represent all our good works. We're going to go to church. We're going to be a good person. We're going to give money to the poor, all those kind of things. Here's my good works. Now, here's the problem. When you look at this person, you don't see their sin. You see their good work. But the sin is still there, and the sin is still separating it from God. And so we can't just cover, in fact, now notice that not only does my sin separate from God, but what else is separating me from God? This right here. See, you know your religion can keep you from having a relationship with God? Do you know that your own righteousness can keep you from having the righteousness of God? And now even my good things are between me and God. So I can't cover up the sin. I've got to get rid of the sin. And how do you get rid of the sin? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God hath made him Christ who knew no sin. He was perfect to become sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, when he died on the cross, he didn't die to pay the wages of his sin because he was perfect. He died to pay the wages of my sin. He died in my place. And if I trust him as my savior, he will take those sins. The word in the Bible that's used, the word impute, is an accounting term. And it means he took my sins and put them to his account. And he took his righteousness and put them in my account. And it's like, and when you got your wallet out, you can pull out some money. It's like if I offer to give you money. You, but you've got to receive the money. See, there's all kinds of illustrations. No, I'm giving money away, Mike. I'm sorry. Um, there's all kinds of illustrations. See, in simplicity and sincerity, you've got to be able to sew the gospel together. Kind of one, two, three, four, five. Here's how it goes in presenting the gospel. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You've got to be ready. You know... <clears throat> I'm so glad I'm a man for a lot of reasons, okay? Don't have to put holes in my ears. Uh, I, I, I don't have to wear high heels. I don't have to wear dresses, especially on windy days. And, and there's a lot of reasons. I don't have to have babies. That's the main reason right there, okay? There's a lot of reasons I'm glad I'm a man. But one of the reasons I'm glad I'm a man is I don't carry a purse, uh, okay? Your guy, you carry one of those man purses, that's, that's okay. You do what you want to do. But I have no interest. In fact, I don't even try. I, I, I do everything I can to avoid carrying my wife's purse. Amen. Uh, I just, uh, I, I'll do it if I have to. If she's laying on the ground having a heart attack, I might pick up her purse for her. Uh, but I'll, I'll do it if I have to. But number one, it's just, it, it doesn't look manly, you know. Number two, it, it just, it, that thing weighs a ton. Because she's got everything in there. My wife will tell me, go to my purse and get my phone, or go to my purse and get my checkbook. And I say, I'm not going in that thing. I don't know what's in there. I mean, I'm afraid something's going to bite me. I'm afraid something's, there's some trap in there. I, I do not like digging through my wife's purse. But you know, if you need something, it's in there. A kitchen sink, it's in there. 
You know, you need money, it's in there. You, need, you know, how many of you ladies have in your purse right now needle and thread or a safety pin? Raise your hand. All right, see a lot of ladies got it. Yeah. You, you need it, they got it. Something's in that purse there. Now don't raise your hand, but let me ask you a question. How many of you right now have got a track in your wallet, your purse, your pocket? If you went to the NEX after church tonight, would you have a track that you could give to that lady behind the counter? Would you have a track that you give to that person at the, at the table next to you? See, if you, if you don't, you're not ready. You're not ready. Are you ready to present the gospel? Are you ready to talk to people about Jesus Christ? See, folks, we've got to be ready and we've got to be all tied all together. Again, Romans 10, 17, faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Acts 8, 35, talking about Philip. Remember Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? The eunuch was riding in a chariot. He's reading his Bible. Philip saw it and said, hey, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I if no man explains to me? And the Bible says in Acts 8, 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He was ready. He was ready for the opportunity when it came. He's ready to make the opportunity. The man didn't talk to him first. He talked to the man. Are you ready? If you want to see souls saved, a lot of times people say, Pastor, I've never seen anybody saved. Here's a simple, basic principle. The more seeds you plant, the more crop you're going to see. If you're not seeing souls saved, then start planting more seeds. It's that simple. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly, shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully, shall reap also bountifully. You want to see people saved? Get out sign waving, go out prayer walking, give out tracts, invite people to church, give your testimony whenever you can, to sit down and tell people directly, this is how you get saved. And you're going to see crops. You're going to see a harvest. In Galatians 6, 9, the Bible says, And let's not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You see, if you're not seeing souls saved, then you're not planting enough seeds. You want to see results? Get out there and do something. Remember Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, it talks about faith like a mustard seed. See, folks, it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about believing this is powerful. It's about believing that the seed is amazing. When you believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, then you're going to plant seeds. And we need to plant seeds. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But not only planting, but you also need to water you can't just plant a seed and leave it. And this is where the patience come in. You got you to water that seed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husband or you are God's building. See, sometimes you're called of God to plant the seed. Sometimes you're the one that waters. There's many people that I've, I've had a chance to talk to. and They already knew the gospel. I would just come along, pour a little bit of water on it. And then there's others where I was the one that got to harvest what was already planted and watered. And now they're ripe, ready to harvest. But we need to be out there planting the seeds. And then we need to water the seed. If it's a seed you planted, water it. Maybe somebody else's seed, but water it. You water it with the word again, Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You know, there's times I've talked to people and I've just laid out the plan of salvation. I couldn't have been any clearer. One, two, three, four, five, but they didn't understand. And then next time I talk to them, we talk about some more and they still didn't understand. Next time we talk about some more, each time I give them the word of God and, and the word of God just continues to work and, and to break through that rock and the hardness and, and, and they come to Christ and you water it with the word of God. You also water it with tears. He that soweth and he that goeth out uh, forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come with rejoicing. You got to cry for the lost. 
You got to cry and say, Lord, my, my cousin needs to get saved. My neighbor needs to get saved. My coworker needs to get saved. Lord, Lord, I pray that you, I, I, I want souls, Lord. I want people to come to Christ. And you got to, you got to pray with tears. <clears throat> There's a little chorus that I really like. It's called, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. You know that chorus? Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I humbly do my part to win that soul to thee. Caleb, would you stand up and lead us in that chorus right now? Let's just all sing it together. Go ahead and just come up here and stand and just go ahead and listen it. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I faithfully do my part to win that soul for thee. And that's really what it's all about. God, put them on my heart. You know, when you start singing that song and making it a prayer, you will begin to see people differently. You'll begin to see people in their need. And God just starts bringing people in your way that you can witness to and tell about the Lord. We also need to water with baptism. The Bible says in Matthew 28, 19, 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, we know that baptism is not a part of salvation. Okay, somebody's never baptized. The thief of the cross was never baptized, and Jesus said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Baptism is not a part of salvation. It's a picture of salvation. So that you get saved, then we need to get, them, get baptized, and then we teach them. I praise God this morning. We had uh, two new classes, one-on-one uh, -on -one classes in the book of the Continued, starting with some folks who are newly saved. We got another one starting next week and another one starting on Wednesday night. So we'll have four classes. That's important. See, once we give them the gospel, then we got to help them to grow in Christ and disciple them and, and lead them to the next step of baptism and then teach them all things. One reason that plants don't grow bigger and produce fruit because they don't get watered after they, after they sprout. Once the word of God is sprouting in their life and they're saved, now we need to grow them in the Lord. We also need to water with our giving. Go over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Back in March, we had our missions conference. And we just want to remind you again how important it is that we are watering through our giving to missions. In verse 15, it says, Know you Philippians now also the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Papadites things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know what's interesting? We had our missions conference in March. And we almost doubled our giving to missions. You know what? We've also almost doubled the souls getting saved. See, when, when we give to reach people around the world, God blesses us right here at Ohana. And we water through our giving. So we need to plant the seed. We need to water the seed. And you know what? That just takes a lot of patience and faith. Turn over to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. The reason I chose the pineapple is because it just takes patience. It's 18 to 24 months. That's a long time to wait. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, on the coming of the Lord. Behold the husbandman. I, I just can't, I can't go by this. I just think it's so interesting that the, our, our Bible uses the word husbandman to describe a farmer. And I want to remind you, men, that you are the farmer of your family. If your wife is not producing fruit, if your family's not producing fruit, whose fault is it? If I've got a fruit tree in my yard that's not producing, I don't go out there and kick the fruit tree and say, stupid tree. 
I have to look at myself and say, what am I not doing for that tree so it can produce? You're the husbandman of your family. You're the farmer of your family. Remember that, man. But the husbandman and the farmer waited for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. You see, you've got to be patient. You've got to have faith. You plant the seed and you've got to have faith that God's going to bring a, a, a harvest. You, you've got to have patience to continually work that seed and not just to plant it, walk away, but to, you don't just sit there and wait for it to happen. You've got to be busy while you're waiting. Because what you want to ultimately do is harvest the crop. Go over to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Verses 36 through 38. Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 through 38. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into the harvest. Now, we don't grow pineapple very much here in Oahu anymore. There's just a few test plots and such, but it's really not like it used to be. It used to be you go driving out in the North Shore, there's just fields and fields and fields of pineapple. And I remember back in 1980, in the, in the early 80s, when we first came here, uh, they, they plant the, 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 the pineapples in, <clears throat> at different times, and they would grow ripe at different times. And when a pineapple ripens, you've got to harvest it now. When it's ready, you've got to do it quickly. And so you all the time would hear them on the radio or something and say, they need, they need workers in the field. If you want extra money, if you want an extra job, they're hiring right now to harvest the pineapples because now was the time. It's interesting, Jesus did not say, pray for souls to be saved. He said, pray for labors to get in the field because there's souls out there to get saved. And that's what we pray here at Juana Baptist Church. We need more people out sign waving. We need more people out doing the prayer walk. If you don't know what the prayer walk is, there's a flyer about it out here in the, in, by the glass doors. It's basically, we've got these hangers, door hangers, and what you do is you just walk your neighborhood, walk down the street and stop at each house, and at that house, you pray for that house, just a, about a minute prayer, 30 seconds to a minute prayer, and then you leave the flyer hanging there. And it combines two things. God said that we're to pray for the lost and we're to go out to reach the lost. And you don't even have to knock on their door. You're not inviting the church or anything. You're just praying for them. And this says in the back that uh, we prayed for you today. And if they have any special prayer requests, they can send them to church. And it's just a way that you can get out in your community and let them know that there's somebody that cares about them. And, and I believe as we do this, if every family in church would do this once a week, just start with the block by your house and just once we go a block further and a block further and a block further, I believe that we would see amazing things happen. Do it at your workplace. Go in and pray for that office and leave them on the desk of the people that you prayed for. Don't be intrusive. Don't be pushy. But just, just reaching out there. If we'd have that happen, what would God do? If every one of you made it your goal to invite at least one person to church every Sunday, what would happen? Now, statistics tell us that for every 10 people you invite, one will come. And so why not make it your goal to invite 10 people? If you make it your goal every week to tell one person about Christ, specifically giving them the gospel, rather than a letter or an email or by phone or in person, hey, can I come over and tell you about something that I think is really important? If you would just make that commitment, what would happen? See, folks, it's not a need for souls to be saved. It's a need for people to go and tell them about Jesus. That's where we're falling short. And that's why we're not seeing the harvest that's available to us. It's a call for workers. It's a call to come. You know, in Jesus, in Mark chapter 10, he sent his 12 disciples out. And then again, in Luke chapter 10, he sent 70 out. He says, we got to have more. We can't stop here. One of the things I want to challenge you to do is learn to listen. Learn to listen. There are people everywhere that are looking for Jesus. And they're screaming, and we're not hearing them. Remember Acts chapter 8, Philip saw the Ethiopian read, reading his Bible? There are opportunities every day, if you listen, where you can hear people. Man, I, I just don't know what life is all about. Boy, it just, everything seems to be going wrong in my life. 
those are opportunities to tell them about Jesus. It's opportunities. And we're missing them every day. People are telling you, tell me about God. And you walk right by them, not paying attention. You got to listen. You know, one of the things, uh, my wife is from Minnesota. I'm not. And when we went there, <clears throat> Minnesota, they grow a lot of corn. And one thing a bunch of people tell me, is says, you can hear corn grow. And I said, right. Yeah, right. And they said, no, you can watch it and hear it grow. Did you know that? In fact, here's a video. We got a video of that. If we can put that video on. This is, a, this is an actual time video. Watch it here. Got the volume up too? Okay, give him a second there. I've actually done this, stood out in the field. Can you turn the volume up a little more? Isn't that amazing? You could actually hear and see it grow. You know what? Open your ears this week. You got coworkers. If you just listen, they're saying, tell me about Jesus. And they don't say it in those words, but they're saying that. You got store workers that just want you to give them a Bible track. I gave out one the other day, and the lady, her face lit up, says, wow. I've never had anybody tell me that. Give me one of those. Uh, that was great. Now, you, you just don't know what God is going to do with that and how he's going to do that when you give out a Bible track. You know, God will bless you. We, Jason, Zambex and I, we went to the conference in the mainland, and we were at, uh, we went to Universal Studios afterwards to check it off my bucket list, and I'm done with them. I don't want to go back, but uh, we had a good time. My wife went on four of the rides, three of the rides. The, the, she wouldn't go on the real rides, but she went on the virtual ones, and she went, the whole time she was on there, she was like this. She had her eyes closed. I don't think she opened them once, but I got her on there. But we were, we, we got there first. We, we stopped by to ask a guy where to go for something. And uh, when we were done talking to him, Sandbags gave him a track. And, and after he looked, wow, he was really excited about it. And he turned around and he gave us one of the passes, the universal passes where you get to bypass everybody. He gave us a pass for free. It pays to witness. <laughs> okay? But anyway, the thing is, listen. Open your ears. There are people that are crying for Jesus. And you have such an opportunity if you just pay attention and listen. You plant the seed and you harvest one at a time. In John chapter 1, the disciples went and found their friends, their brother and their friend, and said, brought him to Jesus. You know, we got this idea, I've got to win this big crowd to Christ. You know, we're having a revival coming up, and I hope you're excited about that. I hope you'll plan to be a part of it. And it'd be great if we had a 1,000 people saved to revival, right? Wouldn't that be great? Do you know if a 1,000 people got saved every night, every night, if a 1,000 people got saved, it would take 10,000 years to reach the present population, forget the population growth, to reach the present population for Christ. 1,000 people a night got saved to take 10,000 years. But if every Christian, if you would win one person, if you would win one person to Christ each year, just one, disciple them, teach them to be a soul winner, and then next year they and you would win one person to Christ, and then next year the four, and so on, okay? If you did that, we would reach the world in 32 years. It's not the evangelists, it's not the big campaigns. It's the one-on-one -on -one soul winning discipleship that is going to reach this world for Christ. Here's a quote I've heard a number of times. I don't know where it came from. I think it was uh, the guy start navigators. But put the quote on the screen if you would. If each one won, one won, how long would it take the one ones to win the world to Christ? If every one of you here in one month won one person to Christ, what would happen? And then you disciple them. And then you go together. That's all it takes. 
But it's not going to happen with a so-so attitude. We've got to be willing to sow the seed if we want to see the fruit.